how to deal with receiving a cease and desist letter from big tech. I'll say this is going to be a fun one. I have some weird experience battling big tech. And uh, yeah, seems like this author did as well. And in weirdly similar places to my experience too. I will say before we go any further, neither I nor the author are lawyers or legal representatives. Take everything we say with a grain of salt. This is based on our experiences and our understandings of things. And it's about us, not you. Don't apply this to yourself without seeking counsel of your own. In July of 2021, Facebook sent me a cease and desist letter because I made a browser extension, unfollow everything, which helped people use Facebook less. This is a fun one because I've also published Chrome extensions to make Facebook less fun, but more usable. The one I published a while back was, uh, what was it called? Buzz Off. It was a parody of BuzzFeed because BuzzFeed was ruining everyone's news feeds. So I made a plugin, Buzz Off, that would auto hide any BuzzFeed posts from your feed. Very, very fun and useful. And you could also add different pages you wanted to hide from your feed too, before they had like the equivalent of a mute feature. That said, my project was not big enough to get the attention of Facebook, much less to have a cease and desist letter sent. So let's take a look at this letter. Dear Mr. Barkley, we represent Facebook Incorporated based in Menlo Park, California and Facebook Ireland, LTD, based in Dublin, Ireland. Interesting that they have to call up both of the companies. Facebook has gathered evidence that your Chrome extension, unfollow everything for Facebook, facilitates unauthorized functionality on Facebook. Specifically, your extension automates actions on Facebook, including mass following and unfollowing of friends, pages, and groups. Your extension also impermissibly makes use of Facebook's trademarks. These activities violate Facebook's terms. I will say the use of Facebook and the trademark there, gut feel, that's the bigger issue you using browser behaviors to do specific things is much, much harder to get a cease and desist valid for. You, you, good luck suing him for that. But uh, the trademark, yeah, they should probably remove the logo. Actually, I had this problem with Microsoft where Chrome Tana, which is my Chrome extension for redirecting Bing searches to other places when you use the Cortana search in Windows 10, that Chrome extension definitely rubbed Microsoft the wrong way. So much so they actually interviewed me, but my interview was with the Bing team. And the reason for that was the head of Bing's growth and engagement really wanted to have a conversation with me about why I made Chrome Tana. Wild, wild experience. I should definitely do a video about that in the future. But uh, yeah, they kind of just bullied me. They didn't threaten me the same way a season assist would have. They did go to Google, though, and asked Google to take down my extension because the Chrome Tana logo was too close to the Cortana logo. Specifically, I used the Cortana blues in a Chrome-like logo, and they claimed they own trademark of the colors. So I changed the colors and they shut up. Fun times. One more quick Chrome Tana tangent, because it's funny. They had some bot set up because with Edge, they wanted to make the Edge store as full as the Chrome web store. And since Edge is based on Chromium, you could use the same extensions in the same binaries. They had some bot set up that would email all the top Chrome extension devs being like, hey, yo, want to put your thing on the Microsoft store? We'll help out. We'll do all these things. And I finally caved. It's like, yeah, sure. Let's put my popular Chrome extension on the Microsoft store. And I actually went through and submitted it. And they had no idea what to do because they did not want Chrome Tana on the Microsoft Store. And eventually I went through like three phases of review before they finally said, sorry, this uh, doesn't comply with our terms. And they linked me some new terms they had just written, clearly to keep me from publishing my extension. Absolutely hilarious. Just like funny to think on the other side, how much of this type of chaos happens where Microsoft's trying to compete with Google. But as they reach out to people like me to do that, they realized that a lot of us were competing with Google and Microsoft both at the same time already. Just utter madness. So a lot of sympathy to this author. No more tangent. Back to reading. Over the years, a number of developers who have also received cease and desist letters from Facebook have gotten in touch with me. So here's a roundup of my advice. Disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer and nothing here should be taken as legal advice. I'll try to add caveats throughout where my experience may not be relevant. Point zero, anticipate the risk. If you've already received a cease and desist letter, skip to the next step. But if you're making software or doing research that's adversarial to big tech, and you haven't thought about all the possibilities of receiving a cease and desist letter, this message is for you. Be aware that it could happen any day. I didn't understand that making software that interoperated with Facebook opened me up to the risk of a cease desist letter as well as a lifetime ban. Being more aware of that could have set my expectations better so that I wouldn't have been so shocked. Handy rule of thumb. If you're doing almost anything, including but not limited to software, that interacts with big tech platforms inside or outside of official APIs or services, you are at risk of receiving a cease and desist letter, even if you don't see what you're doing as adversarial to the platform. Important call out. And yes, to people shocked about the lifetime bans, you can absolutely get a lifetime ban from things. I, I have things I want to mention, but I don't want to lose my Google ad rev, so I'm not going to. Let's just say in the past, I was told I would never get Google ad rev again. Thankfully, they've since revoked that. But yeah, you lifetime bans are very real in this world. Sending out cease and desist letters is very easy, and these platforms have a lot of money, so it makes sense for them to cast the net wide. 
Here are some things that can lower your risk. One would be working within a large organization with a legal and PR team ready to defend you, which will make big tech platforms think twice before hitting send. And point two, which is that working on something that is clearly in the public interest and that will blow up in big tech's face if they try to ban it, like research. Big tech's scared to see and research. This is a good point. Note that neither of these stopped Facebook from sending New York University researchers a cease and desist in 2021, so there are no guarantees here. Good points. Now that you're anticipating the risk of a cease and desist, here's a few preparatory steps. Point one, download a copy of all of your data. I'll triple down on this one. I actually make it a point to go through all the services that I rely on, going through their legally mandated download your data flows so I can have backups of everything I might ever care about in the future in case I either get banned or the service goes down. Most of these services are now legally required to provide a way to archive all your data. It might not be the most usable formats, but it's there. And if the service was to go down or you were to lose access, you can write scripts or talk to others or use ChatGPT to make that data useful again. Y'all should be downloading your data from the services you care about as regularly as you comfortable doing. And I think this is a very good call out. Doing this regularly is important, especially if you're not based in a jurisdiction like the UK or EU where you're legally entitled to demand your data even after being banned. It's also really cool. In those regions, if you're banned, you could still get your data back. But in the US, you can't, so download it often. Point two is that you have to make sure nothing critical in your life relies on using the platform. So like I can shit on Facebook all day because I don't really rely on it. Like losing my Instagram would suck because I wouldn't talk to my skater friends as easily. It wouldn't be that big a deal to lose access to my Facebook stuff. But I also love React and work closely with the React team and don't want to have issues there. So I personally probably wouldn't go after Facebook, but it would be reasonable. Versus Google, I cannot touch Google. If they decide that I am malicious and they don't want to work with me in the future, they'd have full legal right to ban my YouTube and Google accounts forever. And now this channel is dead. That's not something I'm interested in risking. So if there were ever things I could do that would be malicious in the direction of Google, I'd have to be very, very, very careful about whether or not I'd do it. So just a practical example, I personally would be relatively willing to challenge Facebook, but I would be very scared to do the same with Google. Point three, read the platform's terms of service to understand things that they might accuse you of doing that breach that agreement. Yes, I know you'll have to become one of approximately three people in the world who's ever actually read that document. Yeah. I've actually read Terms of Service before. I know I'm weird, but it's good to somewhat know what's going on there. But then a very important point four, consult a lawyer. Specifically, consult a lawyer in your jurisdiction to get the opinion of what you're doing versus the terms of service, as well as IP legislation and all the other related things, so that you're not blindsided. Make sure you have the lawyer a phone call away for when you need them. Yep. I have my lawyer, my favorite contacts. You never know when you need it. It's really good to have it when you do. Specifically, in your jurisdiction is important too, because there's a lot of different rules in different states and countries that are very different. One of my favorites is that it's basically impossible to enforce a non-compete rule or clause in California. So if I'm working for Google and I sign a non-compete that says I can't work at companies that compete with Google for six months to two years after leaving, I can quit and immediately go somewhere else. And if I'm in California, they can't do much. If I'm in other states, they have actual grounds to sue. But in California, it basically gets thrown out because we have state laws that prevent that. So having someone that knows your state and your specific rules is very important. So let's move on to what happens once you've received the letter. Very good thing to start with. I'm actually really happy you started with this. Know that you're probably going to be okay. The first time you get one of these letters, it's very stressful. It's very stressful. And if you haven't received one before, it's it's hard to know just how scary it is having a company the size of Facebook not only acknowledge your existence, but not so subtly threatening your existence. It's terrifying. So pointing out like they're meant to feel that way so that you're more likely to comply, don't worry as much, is, that's a good call out. On the actual day things went down, the first thing I noticed was that I couldn't log into my Facebook or Instagram accounts. Then five hours later, Thursday evening at midnight, I received the cease and desist letter. I didn't really understand what it was. I would have wanted to know that one, there was virtually zero chance of going to jail or indeed court. In retrospect, it seems crazy that I was worried about this, but it shows just how scary the experience was and how ill-equipped I was to deal with it. Yeah, it, most people, when they get a document like this the first time, that's how they're going to feel. They don't realize that the document in the letter is a very cheap thing to produce. Everything you're worried about is a lot more expensive, like a lot more so. Point two is that a cease and desist letter doesn't mean any kind of formal legal action has started against you. You can file a cease and desist that's entirely bullshit and outside of the law, but you can still send it to somebody. It's just a letter. It's a letter that looks really fancy and legal, but it's just a letter. You don't have to worry about it. You, you should be ready to worry about it, but you shouldn't immediately start. It's notionally a first step towards that kind of thing, but in practice, it's used to scare you into doing what the company wants. And if you do it, they are unlikely to go further. That's again, what I was saying. The point of a CND is almost always to scare you. CNDs are usually sent by someone bigger to threaten someone smaller, because if it's someone smaller sending it to someone bigger, it's less scary. 
but their whole goal is to make you fear it. That's why this call is important, because if they succeed in their goal of scaring you, you're more likely to comply, which is what they want. Don't fear the letter. Act on it. Point three, companies can put all sorts of outrageous claims and demands in a cease and desist letter, even if they aren't true or legally enforceable. It's essentially a bullying tactic. Wow, this article is, I swear I didn't pre-read this. They can reference parts of their terms of service that you signed up to, which will make things sound scarier, but those terms may themselves be completely unfair. That's another fun thing. So many terms of service just have things that are illegal in them. They just boldly, confidently claim things that will not hold up in court at all, but no one's challenged them in court, so they've sat there for years. In fact, they might have been challenged in court. The court may have ruled the things illegal and shouldn't be in there, and they just never get to it. So there isn't really much punishment for including things in your terms of service that aren't real, true, or enforceable. Again, Great point here. Companies have unfair terms of service because they're a wish list of how they'd like the world to work, which will stand up until it gets challenged in court or chastised by a regulator. And this will take years. So even if the company is quoting their terms at you, bear in mind that some of these may be completely unenforceable if the matter were to reach court. Again, to go back to the non-compete example, you probably signed terms that say you will not work at a competitor until a certain time frame has passed after your job. That just isn't legal to enforce in certain places. So knowing how much the document that's being quoted against you is even legal, much less enforceable, is an important thing to know. So again, talk to your lawyer. Point four. The point of cease and desist letters is to get you to stop. This is also a very important thing. Like they're not trying to, while scaring you is kind of a goal here, it's not the focus. The focus is to make the things stop happening that they don't like. Scaring is just a method to get there. If you stop, and if you didn't do anything very bad at all, likely that'll be the end of the matter. I get the sense that the key metric the law firm representing the big tech company is trying to hit is quite simply, did they stop? Although the company may still keep following up with other demands, as we'll see later. Another fun thing, they might just keep hitting you up with stupid shit, and eventually you can ignore them and they'll probably stop. Point five, oh, this is way too real. The letter may try to gaslight you. There may be claims in there that are false, defamatory, insulting, etc. This doesn't mean you can take their threats any less seriously, unfortunately, but it does make the whole situation even more messed up. Do not rush to react to these false claims. Go to the next section first. Very good call out. Section two, figure out your first actions. So you're staring at your cease and desist letter. What should you do next? One, I'm depressed to be writing this, but if it's relatively costless to you to pause providing the software or service they're targeting, and you don't have access to a lot of money for legal funds, I would go ahead and pause immediately. The reality is that you're being bullied by a firm with virtually infinite resources, and at this point, while you're still in shock and scared, it's probably best to simply take a pause. You can always change your mind later once you've had the chance to get more comfortable with the situation. Two, there may be an aggressive deadline to respond on the cease and desist letter. For me, it was 48 hours, and I received it on a Thursday night at midnight. I would strongly advise that you don't rush to respond to the letter and find a lawyer to advise you first. Last thing you want to do is reply with an email where you make a bunch of statements that the company can use against you because you don't understand the law. 48 hour deadline is plainly ridiculous. That's not enough time to get legal advice and decide how to respond. It's all part of the bullying tactics, but you should still respond within a week or so. Yeah, they love those bullshit deadlines. Three, there also may be a laundry list of demands in the letter. Explain how your software works. Give us a list of the domains that you own and operate. Tell us the revenue that you make from the software. Agree to never again do X, Y, and Z. I would roundly ignore all of their demands for now. It's simply stick to pausing the software or service and not responding yet to the letter. Four, bringing these points together looks like the following. Find a lawyer, pause the software or service if there's minimal downsides to doing so, and don't reply until you find a lawyer. Five, another thing to note. At this point, you'll likely have been banned from the platform, but if you haven't yet, immediately download all of your data from all accounts. They may not have spotted an account or two. Yes. Section three. Realize that your options are limited. Receiving a cease and desist letter is a great life hack to realizing this fundamentally depressing fact about most legal systems. There's a star here, so we'll find where that star is linking in a second. It doesn't matter if you're right. It matters if you have money, time, and willpower to go to court. Apparently, there are some legal systems, particularly in Europe, where the cost of taking big tech to court are lower. You'd have to ask your lawyer about that. The time and willpower aspects may be similar, though. Yeah, there, there's an important thing that, like, is the case in a lot of other countries that isn't the US where if I have to defend myself in a bullshit case and is determined the case is bullshit, the person who is trying to sue me doesn't have to pay my legal costs. So if they spend $10 million trying to sue me and I spend $1 million to prove their suits are bullshit, I have to spend that million out of pocket and 
they're not affected any further than what they spent. Counter suing for damages to make my money back so they have to pay for my defense is incredibly rare in the US and it rarely ends up going through even when it does happen. So you should expect that any costs you spend defending yourself, even if you succeed, those costs are eaten. In other countries, when a case fails, the defense costs go to the person who was trying to sue, which disincentivizes bullshit lawsuits, but also lowers the bar for when someone who might have actually been a victim of something does the lawsuit. So it's positives and negatives. They've hard balance to strike. But I will say the U.S. isn't great in this regard because defending yourself is way more expensive than it should be, even if you're 1000 percent in the right. Anyways. Let's say you find a lawyer as advised in the previous section. You consult them about the cease and desist letter and they are bowled over by how weak the legal arguments are. They say there's no way a judge or jury would allow their demands and their ban to stand. Great, nope, because now you need to risk your finances, mental health and years of your life to litigate against the big tech company. In other words, it's completely irrelevant that you're right and they're wrong. Yeah, that's the point I was just trying to make. You're, you're fucked either way. So. Even if you're sure that you're in the right and that you would almost certainly win in court, you can't realistically do anything about it. The sooner you accept that, the better. The exception, if you are working at a university or some other big organization, or if you're extremely rich, in that case, you'll have lawyers aplenty, although the mental toll and the time you'll have to spend may still not be worth it. And you're still unlikely to get your accounts back since platforms are at liberty to deny you access to them for a whole variety of reasons. Still determined to take the matter to court, but don't have money, you can do one of two things. You know you're fucked when the first option is crowdfunding. That's how you know you're doomed. Because as the author says here, it will be difficult since there are more worthwhile things people can donate to than a legal case against the enormous company, which you're unlikely to win. Yeah, like I could donate to help my friend get their kidney replaced or I could donate to help you lose a case against Microsoft. That feels like an easy choice. I'm sorry. And then point two is you can ask a foundation for money. Try to get funding for your legal fees from foundations like OSF, Luminate, Reset, and Ford Foundation. Surprise the EFF isn't in here. They've been good about this stuff too. That'll also be difficult unless you're already known to them or can get a very warm intro. These foundations prefer working with people they know and trust, especially on legal issues. That obviously has more risk. And even then, they might not see it as strategically valuable to fund your particular case. And that complication might be that they won't even know how much money to set aside since legal fees can balloon over time. Section four, deciding how to respond. With that in mind, how should we actually respond? You have three options as laid out by this handy article. Ooh, somebody else wrote an article. How to respond to a cease and desist letter. I wish I had this article when I got C. Oh wait, I actually think I read this when I got C and D. No, this is too new. Never mind. This looks very familiar. Pump that he cited this. Let's see what he learned from it. Three options. One, ignore. Two, comply. Three, defend. The first option of ignoring completely and choosing to keep offering your software or service is incredibly risky. The big tech company may very likely take you to court and that would really suck. So it's hard to recommend this approach. I, I did a hybrid of one and two when Chrome Tana got DMCA'd. I ignored the email they sent because fuck Microsoft, I was not planning to respond to them. But I knew the only valid thing they had was the trademark argument around the color. They went after the logo hard. So I had a random fan make a new logo quick. I swapped the logo. I resubmitted to the Chrome web store and then I pinged Google on the support ticket of, hey, this is now complying. Can you reinstate the app? And they went and did it. And I never replied to Microsoft. And the only time I heard back was when they did that bullshit interview. So yeah, just fixing the one small thing that they had and ignoring their C&D happened to work for me in that case. And then they did the fake job interview, which was bullshit in its own ways. Regardless, I didn't completely ignore. I largely ignored and that happened to work for me. As the author calls out, the big tech company may very likely take you to court and that would really suck. So it's hard to recommend that approach. Complying is the best way to make this whole issue disappear. You get your life back to normal. But you can always do so selectively. Stop doing whatever you're doing, like taking down the app or the service, but then ignore other demands that you see as unfair or onerous. I just told that story. Based on my experience, it's likely the big tech company will not pursue you any further, although they may follow up for a while. Yep. There is an important exception. If you desperately need your accounts back, for instance, your entire livelihood depends on it. If that's the case, you probably want to comply fully with every single thing they ask. Be a completely open book. Don't be remotely adversarial in any of your dealings. There will still be no guarantee of getting any accounts back, but it's your only chance. Very real. The same way a restaurant can kick you out if they don't want to service you for any bullshit reason. And a, a service like Facebook can do the same. It sucks, but the alternative suckier. So I sympathize. You're not going to sue them into reinstating your account. Finally, you can defend yourself. You have the time, money, and willpower. But as dealt with in the previous section, this could end up being seriously, seriously painful, even if you're completely in the right. There is, however, a way for you to fight this through non-legal means. Section five, go to the court of public opinion. 
If you want to get catharsis and cause big tech grief, the most viable option is to take the fight to the court of public opinion. Tell the world about what happened. Post the letter everywhere you can. Keep up a drumbeat. One post won't get you anywhere. Try to enlist sympathetic journalists to write about the situation. A lot of journalists are open to cold outreach through social media. This was killer for me. My first times being in real journals and like getting cited in Wall Street Journal and shit was around this stuff, especially because Microsoft was starting to get a little more shit for their antitrust stuff at the time. I was able to get cited in a bunch of different things because I was the author of a thing that was trying to break Microsoft's monopoly that they didn't like. And since that angle existed, since there was an existing story Story I could attach myself to, I became relevant in the journalistic world about this stuff. And to this day, I've maintained a lot of those connections and I still am somewhat regularly cited in a bunch of different news sources because they know they can trust me now because I built that trust through this chaos. Point three is that you can reach out to super users of your app and other sympathizers and ask them to share your post widely. I did this. I had decent presence on Reddit at the time with Chromtana, and I wrote a blog post that was citing a bunch of the antitrust cases with Microsoft in the past to try and explain why I was in the right here. And those went viral enough to definitely keep Microsoft quiet. And then point four is to contact politicians who represent you. For instance, your local senator or representative, or even your MP. At the very least, they may be able to link you to journalists or offer their sympathy. This is an underrated option that more people should take. I didn't at the time. Probably should have. It's worth noting that the strategy is the most likely to go well if your software or research was in the public interest. Side note, if your situation does attract a lot of interest, you may find yourself completely overwhelmed by messages from journalists, tweets, from sympathetic followers, emails of supporters, etc. I'm prepared at this point, but I wasn't at the time. Getting flooded with people wanting your comment on things is stressful. I don't know how I could have managed this better, but I'd just say, be aware that it could happen and that even well-meaning support and valuable media interest can cause a huge amount of stress. If you agree to do an interview, consider doing some online training around how to talk to the media so that you get the points across that you want to and so you don't say anything on record that you don't want to. Not a bad idea. Did I get PR training at Twitch? I think I had to go through some stupid thing I read, but most of my time being cited in shit before was before I had PR training. I'm decent at talking, so I didn't have too much to worry about there. But if you are a little more stressed about it, if you wouldn't be comfortable with like me calling you and asking you a bunch of hard questions about something, you should do some training first. It helps. Section six, be prepared for follow-ups. One deeply unpleasant part of the whole situation was how often and for how long Facebook followed up. For an entire year, from July 2021 to June 2022, they kept sending me emails like the world's most efficient stalker. Then they finally went quiet and I haven't heard from them since. Miss you guys. Well, quality. At the beginning, they sent numerous follow-ups asking for me to agree to all of the demands in the original letter. Then there was a period of radio silence until seven months later where they sent through a new document which they called a proposed agreement. I'm publishing this document here for the first time ever in case it's useful to anyone. Interesting. That's a legal firm sending it. All of these are about their terms of service and use. I've stopped and will not provide again, deleted and destroyed any and all Facebook and Instagram data collected via any application or services. Yeah, this is all bullshit. The breach or obligation described here enough will result in damages to Meta that are difficult to quantify, but all, that all parties agree are reasonably estimated to be no less than $30,000. <laughs> in the event of a breach of this obligation, Meta shall be entitled to recover in its sole discretion the sum of $30,000 payable within 14 days or its actual damages. Meta shall be entitled to recover reasonable attorney's fees paid to recover such sums through legal action. This is fucking bullshit. Don't sign this. I cannot believe they actually sent this actually. Fuck. That's insanity. This is some of the worst... Ugh. But again, they get away with this because this isn't a legal doc. This is a threat. This is a cease and desist, an agreement. An agreement can have anything in it. And they're taking too much advantage of that here. Holy shit. Oh, they even called that out here. The document dangled the possibility of my Facebook and Instagram accounts being reinstated if I agree to similar demands to those in the initial cease and desist letter, like agreeing to never make any software again that interacts with Facebook with a fun twist. In other words, if I agreed to the letter and went on to breach the terms, Facebook would automatically be entitled to at least $30,000. So if they ever change their terms or do anything that they can claim you're violating their terms, you're out 30K and you agreed to it. Guess you have to get creative to bring home the bacon when Apple destroys a chunk of your revenue model. <laughs> That's a good joke. If you don't know, Apple made it so you can't track people between apps, which made it much harder for Facebook to do their crazy ad targeting stuff, and they're not happy about it, so fun. It would have been a terrible idea to sign this letter to get my accounts back, given that Facebook made it clear they would have no actual obligation whatsoever to do this. Here within the document, you may request that Meta reinstate your license to access Facebook and Instagram immediately upon our receipt of your signature on this letter agreement. Provided the terms herein have been satisfied and no further violations of Facebook or Instagram's terms are found. Meta reserves the right and its sole discretion to determine if your license will be reinstated and to terminate your license at any time. So it's, we'll consider it, but we'll also consider deleting it whenever we feel like. This 
this is not a real agreement. To be fair, this is the best you're going to get in a legal doc, but it's still absolute bullshit. So a couple of things to bear in mind. One, you will receive follow-ups. I, I didn't. I will say you don't always receive them, but you probably will. That much is basically certain. And based on my experience with Facebook, it could be for a while. It depends, but yeah. Point two is that you might be given some ray of hope about being able to get your account back, but you'd be sensible to ignore this if the language is anything like what I received. If you really, really need your accounts back, you might want to get a lawyer to draft a response saying you'll consider signing if the wording is tweaked to guarantee your accounts will be restored. Or in the case where it's critical to get your accounts back, you may simply do whatever they say to keep simming cooperative, yada, yada, you get the point. So section seven, moving on. The final stage of grief is acceptance. From what I can tell, in most cease and desist cases, you're not going to get your accounts back. You're not going to be able to keep making the software or doing the research that led to the cease and desist. And you're not going to have money, time or willpower to take it to court. So it should cost as much of a stink in the court of public opinion as you can, which really can have impact because it will add to the nice long list of big tech legal horror stories, which politicians read and eventually create regulations in response to in the EU, for instance. This is a very, very good point. There is basically nothing you can do that costs a company more than an additional argument that a legislator can make to regulate the shit out of them. The day I realized Twitch was dead was the day some dumbass senator had Jeff Bezos in front of him answering questions about Amazon and big tech. And the question he chose to ask was, why are you supporting piracy and the theft of creative content on a platform like Twitch? He confidently asserted that Twitch had no safety precautions whatsoever and that it was a website full of people stealing movies and sports broadcasting. Bezos' response was a simple, I'll have to get back to you on that because he doesn't know much about Twitch. And on top of that, the thing that the senator was saying was a lie. <laughs> The problem here is that now the only time Bezos has heard about and thought about Twitch in a long time is when a senator made him look bad on stage about it. And that is a really, really bad thing in the world of Amazon. And they were going to make decisions to prevent those types of things from coming up. The more these companies can do to prevent strong arguments from being made by legislators that could result in new laws hurting those companies, the better off they are. They're going to do everything they can to avoid these stories being big enough to be cited against them. If you can prove that your story risks being one of those, the amount of damage they're coming after you for whatever reason they're CNDing you is smaller than that potential damage, almost always. So if you can present that the risk to them is great enough that a politician might care and legislate against them, they're gonna give up. They basically have to. It would be irresponsible of them not to. And if you can give them reasons to escalate internally where that happens, you're more likely to get out of it. And if that doesn't work, you can accept the situation and move on to working on something else. Also a fair call out. Section eight, or don't. But if you're stubborn and, like me, don't want to ever accept the situation, then keep writing about it, keep the pressure up on politicians, send your senator, representative, MP, regular updates on what's happening since you first reached out. Stories of big tech bullying can eventually add up to regulation. Very important. Build bridges with organizations in the tech community, like Knight First Amendment Institute, who can and do take legal action to defend developers and researchers. And also, band together with others who have been unfairly targeted, so you can advocate for change together. Whatever you decide to do, remember that you'll get through this, even though it is frankly a horrible, horrible experience. Good luck. He also calls out that you can reach out to him if you've received a CND and you want to commiserate. Really good call out. Huge shout out to Lewis. Not many people have had this experience, much less shared it so coherently. This is a textbook how to handle this, and I'll be saving this article and sharing it a lot. So huge shout out to Lewis for writing this. I am happy to have my experience and the things I've dealt with here documented this well. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I think this is a great one. Till next time. Peace nerds.